Good evening and thank you for joining us. Two inmates at the Thunder Bay District Jail were sent to hospital earlier this week following a violent incident that the Ministry of the Solicitor General describes as an inmate disturbance. City police say at least one of the prisoners was stabbed. The union president at the jail, Bill Hayes, says incidents like this are more frequent than people realize. Yeah, there's a very violent incident, um, and, and these are always concerning for correctional officers, and these happen far too much, uh, especially at the Thunder Bay Jail. Um, seems like every few months or, or we're dealing with something like this, and a lot of it doesn't even make it to the media. Um, this one did, however, uh, due to the seriousness of its nature. Thunder Bay police were called to the jail on Monday afternoon. A police spokesperson confirms that a 33-year-old inmate was taken to hospital with injuries consistent with a stabbing. But a ministry spokesperson subsequently revealed that a second inmate was also injured and taken to hospital. Both victims were treated and released and are now back at the jail. An internal investigation is now underway. Hayes says the jail is currently over capacity with about 140 inmates. And that's when these types of incidents usually occur. If we can keep the inmate population at a decent level, we can, we can give them programming, we can keep them busy. When overcrowding happens, we can't move them anywhere outside of uh, our institution. Uh, things just escalate, tensions get high, tensions get high everywhere. You can feel the tension when you walk into the building. You can tell when things aren't, aren't flowing smoothly and it just gets worse from there. Small infrastructure projects, not massive financially risky ones, are the key to responsible urban development. That, according to an American nonprofit organization called Strong Towns, which hosted a public event in Thunder Bay last night, Basilios Bellows was there. It's being called a radically new way of thinking that will help cities thrive through future developments. A presentation was held at the Italian Cultural Center by Strong Towns a nonprofit that believes there are better ways for places like Thunder Bay to take on future projects in housing, transportation, and development. With any insolvent corporation, uh, bankruptcy is an option, but for cities it's not. President Charles Marone provided the presentation, where he stressed that since the Second World War, cities have been developing in an outward way, leading to immediate but not lasting prosperity. Local governments also took on the responsibility to maintain all those roads, all those pipes. When we look at those two inputs, right, the, the amount that we took on and said we would do and the amount of revenue that it gave us, there's a huge mismatch there. Rather than these huge leaps in development and infrastructure, Strong Towns is advocating for smaller projects in core areas. For example, taking a street in an already developed area and making it more pedestrian friendly rather than continuing to develop a city outwards, which can be costly without confirmed benefits. Councillor Andrew Folds is an advocate of this model and explains how these guidelines would be implemented in future city projects. When council receives a report on anything, is there this strong town's lens that's been applied to the recommendation? Has that sustainability lens been applied to the recommendation? Has that net zero lens been applied? And if it's applied, then we're making a decision that adheres to our very progressive policy. Folds goes on to say there are many city initiatives that would benefit from the Strong Towns approach, including their strategic plan, net zero strategy, and active transportation plan. Vasilio Spolos, TBT News. Resolute Forest Products has hired dozens of Ukrainian refugees to work at its sawmill near Atacokan. The hirings have not only helped them settle in Canada after fleeing the Russian invasion, but it's allowed the sawmill to thrive as well. Lee Noonan was at the mill in Sapawi yesterday and she files this report. There are about 30 Ukrainian refugees now working at the Resolute Mill in Sapawi near Atacokan. Mill manager Greg Kraniski says the massive effort to bring the Ukrainian workers to Sapawi was well worth it. It's the difference between running and not running for us. Uh, so when you add up the dollars and cents at the end of the day, uh, from a business perspective, it was the right decision. From a moral perspective, it was the right decision. From a community perspective, it was the right decision. Kraniski says the people of Atacokan came together to support the workers and that the whole community stands to benefit. Alexander Bakal and Alexander Vasilenko both say they feel supported by the company and welcome in the community. After work on the weekend, they, they give us a lot of support and a lot of different stuff. And I want to 
say thank you for them. I want to say thank you for people who live in here in Atikokan. Bacal says he's learning a lot and enjoying the work. Vasilenko also says he has fun with his job in quality control. He arrived in August and headed straight to work at the sawmill, although not before stopping in at Fort William First Nation to share in a meal. So I came there and they cooked a moose curry. I think it's some kind of soup with moose meat and they give me a try. Unlike Bakal and Vasilenko, many of their compatriots speak little or no English. HR Superintendent Scott Manford says the language barrier was one of the biggest hurdles to overcome, but that despite that, the Ukrainian workers fit in right away. Uh, you expect uh, a lot of hurdles and, and problems with, you know, different nationality, different lifestyle, different philosophies. And when they showed up here, they, they welcomed us with open arms as we did them. Manfred says recruiting Ukrainians has become easier as the workers have been spreading the word and recommending that friends and family come to Atacokan. The pain of being separated from loved ones and seeing the devastation back at home is a problem without a solution, says Bakal. You know, we become more than just a team of work. We live together, we learn a new world together, you know, we discover this beautiful country and these people here together all. Four more workers are arriving from the Ukraine within the next couple of months. And while the mill does prioritize hiring locally, they hope to continue filling any vacant positions with more Ukrainian workers. Lee Noonan, TBT News. The Queen's Park now, and another sign that we're nowhere near the end of our health care crisis in this province. A new report is sounding the alarm over underfunding and a shortage of frontline workers. It says if the problems persist, Ontario will be short more than $21 billion in health spending by 2028. Siobhan Morris has the details. Ontario's financial accountability officer says the government is coming up short, really short on cash to deliver on its health care promises. Peter Weltman says the PCs will need an extra $21 billion to make good on plans to add beds in hospitals and long-term care. There are not only a funding shortfall, there's a capacity shortfall. We, uh, we sort of identify some of the root causes, um, but there are many policy options available that can address some of those some of those causes. The Premier dismissed the FAO's report as a snapshot, one Weltman acknowledges doesn't include additional announcements. We're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at health care, but this is the reason we need to do things differently. The Finance Minister defended how much the government has put into adding capacity across the board. We've seen the health care budget go up by over $5 billion last year. We're going to continue. With investments already on the books, the FAO says Ontario is going to fall short by 33,000 nurses and PSWs to care for people in the beds it plans to add. We're going to fill the pipeline with as many uh, students that want to become nurses and give back to the community and the health care uh, situation. The FAO has taken into account programs to accelerate credentialing of internationally trained nurses and higher enrollment in nursing programs. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. Hoping to address a historic labour shortage, the Ontario government is making it easier for students to pursue a career in the skilled trades. Our government is investing over $1.5 billion in our skilled trade strategy, working hand-in-hand -hand with the labour unions, business groups, and our schools, colleges, and universities to train the skilled workforce our growing economy needs. Under the new plan, grade 11 students will be allowed to enroll in full-time skilled trades apprenticeship programs. Once they receive their certification, they can then apply their credits toward their high school diploma. Around the world, people are marking International Women's Day, celebrating the progress made in the fight for gender equality while recognizing the need to do more. Here in Thunder Bay, the festivities got underway with the raising of the Women's Day flag at City Hall. This morning's flag raising included remarks from Acting Mayor Brian Hamilton and Northwestern Ontario Women's Centre Board member Jan Oakley. For Oakley, there's a lot to celebrate today, but she adds there is still so much work to be done.
I think first and foremost is a day of celebration uh, for all the gains that women have made in our society, in the economic, political, social and cultural spheres. It's also really importantly a day of action and a call to action uh, for continued work, uh, recognizing the gender-based violence that so many women and girls experience here in our community and also globally. At the same time, a group of female students from Superior High School visited the local Carpenters Union for an International Women's Day event. It was a chance for them to learn from fellow women in the trades, a field that's historically been male-dominated, like Lang reports. I'm here at the Carpenters Local Training Center where, as you can tell, it's very, very loud because these high school girls behind me are hard at work building toolboxes in the spirit of International Women's Day. Here's organizer Alana Carley on how this special field trip came together. I just put a call out to the teachers and the guidance counselors to sort of recommend some students that may fit the bill for uh, pursuing an um, opportunity within the trade sector. And then uh, Mr. Dercher from Ontario Youth Friendship Program sort of uh, made the call out to a variety of recent graduates or women in the fields of trades. I think traditionally um, it is male dominant field and so just uh, allowing students to sort of explore opportunities um, that may not have presented themselves. In. The group of around 20 female students ranged from 12th graders who have already been accepted into welding programs to 9th graders that were getting their first taste of carpentry work. Superior CVI Technology Chair John Delory says the workforce of the trade sector is close to 90 percent represented by men but he is pleased to see training programs growing to more of a 50-50 split. Yeah, it's so important for uh, women to be promoted, promoted in the trades. So you see a, a diverse workplace. Uh, other people see like-minded people. A lot of the females we take, they do actually better work than some of the, some of the, uh, some of the male counterparts. And it's, uh, it's just fun to see the excitement, learning, measuring, applying all the hand tools, safety, and to see a project in completion. What do you enjoy the most about working in the trades? It makes me feel powerful because most women don't do trades because they're either scared or think that they can't do it, but they can. I'm a very hands-on learner. I like to be creative and do a lot of like wood, like stuff with my hands. And like I've also built like quite a bit with like being in the carpenters like course in my class. So it's pretty good. A post-secondary education has often been mandatory for students to enter the field of trades. But with such a high demand for trades workers, Delory says some employers are allowing for students to begin their apprenticeships immediately out of high school. Mike Lang, TBT News. Goods & Co. Market also celebrated International Women's Day with a series of networking events called Women & Company. The goal is to provide women in business the opportunity to connect, collaborate and talk about what they have to deal with. The event was hosted by Romy Marlowe Ellis of The Uncommon Woman and May Lynn Hurley of Goods & Co. Market to celebrate women-owned businesses and powerful women in the city and the region. Today, attendees were treated to a lunch with guest speaker Aaron Sisko, the CEO of the Alliance Network. Sisko says having events where women can come together and support one another is very important, especially after the pandemic. To actually be able to connect face to face, there's something so magical about that that just deepens the relationship and really brings it to the next level where we're really able to show up for one another. Yeah, I think that uh, women really thrive in connection. I mean, it's something that we've been doing since the beginning of time. Women sit in circle and we have conversation and we share. And so we just could not wait to get together and have that connection again. Ellis says this event is just the beginning and they're planning on holding more gatherings throughout the year. Well, I'm happy to see all of those International Women's Day events in the city today. We'll turn yeah. into weather now. Fiona, we were under the freezing mark today, so we'll have to just live with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is actually pretty close to normal for this time of year. Uh, we saw an overnight low, very mild actually, minus 8 and a wind chill of minus 13. Normally, we're closer to about minus 12, minus 13 Celsius for the actual temperature. We warmed up to minus 3, about a degree or so off the norm for this time of year, although wind chills did feel like minus 10. That's under the east-northeast uh, winds, 17 to 30 kilometers per hour. Now, to the west, uh, Fort Francis has got some light flurries at this hour, but temperatures have stayed 
pretty mild directly west of Thunder Bay. Atacocan currently on the freezing mark. Fort Francis, minus one, saw temperatures only drop to about minus six last night. But as you head further north, you can see that drop in uh, conditions. Minus four in Kenora, minus five in Dryden, minus four in Uppsala. Red Lake currently minus six. It was uh, definitely a little bit cooler last night to the northwest. They too have some light snow at this hour. Similar temperatures into Sioux Lookout. Armstrong a little cooler at minus seven, minus six in Greenstone. They had a fair amount of sunshine there today, so it was rather nice. Along the North Shore, it's uh, a little closer to Thunder Bay's temperature. Nipigon at minus three, minus one in uh, Marathon. And Sault Ste. Marie right on the freezing mark. It's been mostly cloudy for most of the day. Now, here in the city of Thunder Bay tonight, we will drop down just a handful of degrees again. Minus 7 is expected to be the low with wind chills about minus 12. That's because of the winds off the lake at northeast, 11 to 30 kilometers per hour, and a fair amount of cloud cover. You're going to have to kind of get used to these temperatures. Uh, we had that taste of plus side daytime highs, and uh, it's now going to stay a little bit below, but just a little bit below the freezing mark, and I'll have more details later on in the news hour. Okay, thanks a lot, Fiona. Well, the CEOs of Canada's largest grocery chains are in the hot seat today. They're being grilled by MPs over the soaring cost of food. We'll tell you what they have to say right after the break. Don't go anywhere. Food prices have increased 25 times faster than profits. And at Loblaw, none of those profits came from higher food margins. 